To YouTube team, keep it clean. What's going on? It's Inglazy here with another video and another episode of NFL Questions from Subs, a series where you can ask me any NFL question you want to, and we answer it in a video just like this. If you ever want to be part of it, you can send me an email to teamkeepitclean at gmail.com or for the patrons. You can send it directly on Patreon. Uh, if you'd like to become a Team Keep It Clean patron, just go to patreon.com slash engravenviz. And shout out to all the Team Keep It Clean patrons. Uh, we appreciate y'all. Uh, but this episode is another special episode because it features another special guest. We are continuing questions from subscribers featuring Jason from Huddle It Up Films. Uh, make sure you subscribe to his YouTube channel and also follow him on Twitter. But without further ado... Let's run it back. Next question came from my guy, JD. He said, what's going on, Engraven? I'm a supporter of the YouTube channel and a Ravens fan here in the DMV. I like to perform this exercise with everybody's team to gauge who's really objective about their respected teams. With that being said, I would like for you to mention one positive and one negative aspect of every position group on the team. Oh, my goodness. Oh, this is uh, – ooh. I'm interested to see what the responses are going to be and keep doing your thing on YouTube. Um, wow. So one positive and one negative about every aspect of the team. Um, I guess I, I start with quarterbacks. If you want to do running backs, I do offensive line. Then you there do you receivers. Okay. All right. So quarterbacks, uh, one positive, um, I would say is just the ability that both of them have, uh, Lamar Jackson and Tyler Huntley, but more so to focus on Lamar Jackson. Um, just his potential is through the roof. What he's able to do, uh, is through the roof. Um, one negative, um, I would say would be, I feel like another part that he could add to his game that would make him better or that he doesn't do now, uh, I would say is throw receivers open. Um, and if he added that to his game and, and also, um, yeah, throwing receivers open, that would be the biggest part that I would add to his game. Cause a lot of times, in, in, at least in my eyes, um, I see that he throws to the open receiver, um, but not always throws receivers open. Um, so if he added that, I think that could take him to a whole nother level. All right, running backs. Hey, running backs, the positive is we get a lot of yards after contact with this group, uh, both J Gus and J.K. Dobbins. And now you're seeing it with Tyson Williams, who I expect to make this team one way or the other. Uh, you know, you can have them lined up, have a good angle. The defender can make a great play, and they're going to fall forward for a few yards or just flat out make you miss. Uh, they both, all three of them have a really good sense for where the first down marker is, it seems like, or where the goal mm -hmm. line is. So I love that about this group is, uh, you know, there's no such thing as a, a Gus Edwards negative run. Like, it just seems no matter how bad the blocking is, Gus is going to get at least a few yards out of it. And the negative part is, I'll believe it when I see it, and that's their contributions in the passing game. Uh, I, I, don't want to, I don't like to hear the term concentration drops. I'm tired of it. I don't care what kind of drops they are. A drop is a drop. Uh, so, hey, let's get our receiving down. Let's get our pass blocking down. Let's be better backs in obvious passing situations. Okay, boom. So now uh, offensive line. Offensive line uh, on the ends, they have a, a lot of experience. Uh, obviously with Ronnie Stanley on the left side and Alejandro Villanueva uh, on the right side. Um, and it, that should be, especially in this run heavy offense, that should help both of them, uh, be better. Um, now I know we've heard about Alejandro struggling a bit throughout the preseason training camp and whatnot. Um, but this being such a run heavy team that should help him out a whole lot. Uh, negatives, um, would be mm, right now could be the uncertainty at the left guard position. I'm sure after this last preseason game coming up, depending on when you see this video, uh, that will clear a lot of that up. Um, but also the, uh, the, just the strength of the, for me, for Bradley Bozeman, um, is he really going to be able to get a good amount of push up front? I know he used to play some before, so he's used to it. Um, but sometimes it seems like he struggled a little bit. Uh, we're giving up some interior pressure. So that, that's what I would go with with that. So Jason, the receivers. Ooh, okay. Receivers, you got me. The, um, the upside and the pluses is that we are more stacked there and we have more depth it's a better group than we've had the last two years uh you know it, it just it just is i mean if you just look at the potential uh of the receivers and not only that the proven history of the receivers i mean we're young with bateman and wallace but mm -hmm. duvernay and prochet really didn't have a chance last year with uh no real off season mm -hmm. hollywood's getting better and better i expect actually a big year from hollywood because of all the support that he has throughout 
the negative is obvious, man. They're the health. They're not on the field right now. Uh, it's making me nervous. Like I, I see Hollywood working and he's a pretty durable guy who's played through screws in his foot. So I'm, I'm not worried about Hollywood, but man, would it make me feel better to see Sammy Watkins and Rashad Bateman out there together uh, just to give more options to this group. So, you know, if uh, I'm not sure when this video is going to view, but I would, you know, I doubt that we're going to see this group together at all before the regular season. So the uncertainty of it makes me really nervous and uneasy. But uh, overall, when I take a step back, I just say, hey, Jason, calm down. This is a better group than we've had the last two years, and we've passed the ball well. All right, so I'll go with the tight ends. Uh, Mark Andrews, specifically, he uh, the explosive plays, they are there. He is like uh, almost like another wide receiver, uh, but playing in tight end position. Um, just the ability that this guy has, he can stretch the field. He can do so much as a tight end. Um, but now at the same time, and that's the positive, but at the same time, the negative, uh, with Mark Andrews having just so much volume, so many passes thrown his way, so many targets, uh, it also comes with the drops. Uh, and, and with the drops, um, it is it's just a part about the numbers. And the more targets you get, the more chances you are going to have to have more drops. Um, but more so a bigger negative that I would, that I see is when Mark Andrews, when it comes to those big games, a lot of times uh, Mark Andrews ends up becoming a non-factor. And I think it could be because teams – and especially in those big games, like more so playoffs too, teams really focus on, on on Mark Andrews. And they're like, hey, we know Lamar, he loves that tight end number 89. So what we're going to do is try to really remove him completely from the equation so he can't hurt us. Um, so that would be my negative for the tight ends. Yeah, All can, right. I, can I comment on that just of a little course. bit? You know, Mark Andrews, the big games is is what I'm looking at uh, in Graven, and I think that there is truth to the fact that he's just getting a ton of, of attention in those games. But if there's a skill, a quality, a trait that I want to see Mark Andrews improve on, it's his catches through contact. When somebody mm -hmm. gets his hand in there, rip that ball away. You see it with Boyle. You see it with other receivers. You know, I love Mark Andrews, and I, I don't think chemistry right. is easily uh, – you can't manufacture chemistry. Mark and Lamar have that chemistry together. They have since the first season they played together. So uh, we need Mark Andrews to make some big catches and big games. Sorry, I just mm. needed to say that. No, you're good, man. Uh, and you can go ahead and take it away with the defensive line now. Defensive line. I, I think that this is going to be a strength of the team um, because of the depth. Uh, I would say the negative, uh, first of all, is just the age and the health. Uh, if you look at Derek Wolf's uh, uh, history, Excellent player, but usually misses time. Uh, Brandon Williams, he's getting up there. Calais Campbell's up there. You have, man, uh, just a great young player in Matt BK. Uh, but the thing that's encouraged me so much this preseason in Graven, and I don't know if you've seen it, is Broderick Washington. Uh, last year, his strength showed up. He's, he's NFL strong as a rookie. He looks stronger, but his pad level and the way he's getting off the snap. And I had the guys from the situation room, and they brought up something that was really good. His eyes. It's something I look for in every defender, their eyes and instincts. This man can push and get a nice push and still keep his eyes on the quarterback and see what's going on. So a big boost to this group. I was really worried about their health and age and depth there. Didn't mm -hmm. know if Roderick Washington was even going to play with the all-field stuff. Yes. But, uh, but man, having the, the Monstars, Matt Abike, Roderick Washington, and then you got Jelly Ellis or Aaron Crawford who can play that spot. I think this is a strength of that team, man. Mm, good, good. I love it. Um, now with the linebackers, uh, the the bright side, the positive, um, these guys are young. They're fast. Uh, they can make a really nice uh, combination. I love uh, Patrick Queen and Malik Harrison. Was definitely looking forward to LJ Fort, but unfortunately he has the season-ending injury. Um but now uh, I would say the negative would be the uncertainty uh, after those guys. I know Chris Board, he he can play. He's got some experience with Welch. Um, a lot of question marks right there with uh, Christian Welch. I'm not sure what he can do consistently on an NFL level yet. Um, but if I had to just really go back to Patrick Queen and Malik Harrison, it would be the inexperience. Um, so there may uh, be times when uh, an offense, especially uh, a – a veteran quarterback or uh, a a seasoned offensive coordinator, well, they they may they may try to test those guys, uh, their young football IQs, and not to say that they don't have football IQs. I'm not saying that, 
but since they're so young, they'll, they'll be in their second year and their first full off season is going to get tested. They're going to get tested for sure. Um, but let's just hope that Wink has these guys ready. So you with the secondary, I think I know what the answer is going to be, but go ahead. You with the secondary, the positive and negative about the secondary. You want me to take the corners or safety or you can, you can take it all. Just the whole secondary. Do you think? Okay. Hey, the secondary, very deep. Another strength of this team. Uh, mm -hmm. I love the depth of it. You know, I try to be engraven. I try to be hard on our team, you know, at, like I want to criticize it, but man, this defense is deep and uh, you have Marlon, you have Marcus. I would say, uh, I just want to say as far as a negative, I want to speak about Tavon for one minute and that's, uh, you know, I think a healthy and effective Tavon, a 2018 Tavon, would make this defense very scary. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're talking about 2018, it's 2021. So uh, another, you know, unknown of this defense, now having Brandon Stevens and seeing our Darius Washington in the slot has given me a lot of confidence that we have the depth that we need in that secondary. Uh, and I think that these young safeties need, will give the chance to play. The question from subscribers, there's, we're going to have three uh, three safeties in on this defense a lot. I expect to see a lot of dime defense, but not a lot of negatives. I would just say that we need Deshaun Elliott to stay healthy and continue to progress as a player because he's mm -hmm. going to be in there 100% of the time if he's healthy. All right. So, um, And I will take the uh, special teams. Uh, you got Justin Tucker, uh, Sam Cook. Um, Nick Moore, the long snapper. <laughs> what? That's all the positive. I mean, what what negatives are there about uh, the? I can't call them the Wolfpack because Morgan Cox went to the Titans. But um, what negatives are there? Like, uh, I, I guess when when you have when you've been so great at your job for such a long time, especially with, with Sam Cook, with Justin Tucker, um, when you do mess up. Uh, it's just, it, it's like, whoa, a lot of people, and, and I've seen it a lot of times, well, not, not a lot of times, because Justin Tucker doesn't mess up a lot of times, but I've seen it where if he misses a field goal, um, even sometimes if he makes a field goal and it barely goes in, I see some people, oh, man, did, did, is Justin Tucker falling off? Is is he regressing? And it's like, come on, it, it's, it's, it's like a gift and a curse, because Justin Tucker, he's been somebody that's been a victim of his own uh, success because he's been so great as a kicker, been so consistent, been so clutch. Like from his rookie year, this dude was clutch, helped kick the Ravens to the Super Bowl, um, and, and won obviously too. But um, when when you've been so great at what you do for so long, uh, when you do slip up, when you do make mistakes, uh, it can be blown out of proportion uh, to a lot of people. So that's what I would say would be the uh, the the negatives, I guess, uh, with the yeah. uh, special teams unit. Yeah, um, I just had a couple of things to add with mm -hmm. the special teams. It's like if you're on a team with a bad kicker and he misses a kick, it's like, yeah, well, you know, we kind of expected that. But when Tucker misses a kick, it's kind of like, oh, crap, we needed those points. Excuse my language. But like it, it just kind of sets the team back a little bit because you're expecting them to make it. And uh, mm -hmm. the other thing uh, is engraving. I didn't want to forget about the outside linebacker group. Um, okay. The positive is that we added Justin Houston for experience, and that should help us get some uh, pressure with a four-man rush. The negative is we ask our outside linebackers to do so much, and Matt Judon was one of those guys who could do a little bit of everything. Um, that's part of the reason I think Yannick wasn't had back is because Yannick was a pass rusher, a little bit trouble setting the edge, wasn't comfortable dropping. So when you play outside linebacker for us, you better be able to set the edge, number one. <laughs> You better be able to rush the passer and coverage. And with these young guys, um, you know, it's a lot. It's a big ask for Adafi Way and for Dalen Hayes to be good at all three right away. Mm -hmm. McPhee's not dropping in coverage a lot. Jalen Ferguson, hey, he looks in a, like he's in a lot better shape. I mean, I yeah. don't know the person, but, man, he looks like he's fly, flying around. So I would say that the, uh, the, the positives are that we have a very good player and we look deep there, but the negatives is – can you really expect these young guys to do all three things right away? Mm. Okay, perfect. Next question came from my guy, Howard S. He said, what's happening in Graven? I'm just thinking out loud, but I noticed a lot of buzz and attention being paid to our new wide receiver coaches, T. Martin and Keith Williams, and rightfully so, along with our new inside linebackers, Coach Rex Ryan. But I think our new defensive line coach, Anthony Weaver, is flying under the radar. I believe he got our young defensive lineman playing at a high level in this preseason like Broderick Washington and others. I believe he's a big upgrade over our previous defensive line coach, Joe Cully. 
Uh, Joe Cullen only got a production, uh, only got production out of seasoned vets and nothing much out of the young guys. Uh, Anthony Weaver played here and has become a real good coach, and I believe his impact should be more on notice. Uh, what's your thoughts? And hashtag Ravens Nation. Hmm, that's an interesting one. Um, I don't know. I I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, because last year, now with Broderick Washington, uh, like my guy Jason mentioned, uh, he's been definitely doing his thing this offseason so far. But with Matt Abike, Matt Abike, he's a young offensive lineman. And last year, he, like, especially as the season went along and he got more opportunities, he was looking good, man. He he was looking good. So I, I can't say that necessarily that – um. Anthony Weaver is a, a better coach than our previous defensive line coach, but uh, so far so good. You've been seeing uh, consistency, uh, and that's what we want to see, consistency and consistent uh, improvements from the defensive line. Yeah, the magic eight ball says too early to tell. I would say that that's a, a pretty, good, uh, pretty good description, but the one thing I love about Anthony Weaver is that with him playing here so way back in the day, you know, it's like he understands the Ravens culture. Uh, when I watch the press conference with him, you know, you kind of got to sift through the presser sometimes to see what's just coach speak and what's coming from the heart. But it mm -hmm. was just so genuine and Graven. Like, I'm thankful to be here. I know what the deal is. I know what they expect. I know right. the level. Like, he seems really thankful, and I think he uh, will fit right in. And then also, I just wanted to give a shout out to the late Clarence Brooks because uh, what a coach he was. I like seeing his son, Jason. I believe his name's Jason Brooks, making his own way in the game. So shout out to uh, Clarence Brooks. Miss you, brother. Every time I see him in the highlights, I think about that. What a great defensive line coach Clarence Brooks was. Right, next question came from Tamaris J. Um, he said, what's up, Engraving? Hope all is well with you and the fam. It's been a minute since I sent a question, but I enjoy the videos because you are not the type uh, that has unrealistic expectations of the team as a fan. Uh, I have a friend from B-More who refused... <laughs> Who refuses to be a Ravens fan because of Ravens fans? Oh, <laughs> dude, I have one of those too, and he rooted for the Patriots because he can't stand Ravens fans. It's it's, it's the truth, Kramer. If you're out there, I'm, I'm talking about you, bud. But you ain't watching no Ravens video. Oh man, he said I am often frustrated by some of my so-called fans and need to unplug. But I find that it's not so much of that on your platform. And keep up the good work. I, I appreciate it, man. Um, anyway, I just looked at the Ravens schedule this year and was thinking, man, if these teams play up to their potential, we got a lot of work in front of us. I think this is even if we play up to our full potential. I, I personally would love for us to win the Super Bowl, to shut down the Lamar haters and get Calais a ring on his way out. I agree. Uh, but I'm not overly confident in this outcome. Perhaps I just don't want to set myself up for heartache. But I'm interested to hear uh, yours or maybe a guest's opinion. Ah, so good timing. Hey, there like we go. That. And he said, thanks, and keep up the good work at keeping it clean. <laughs> Team, keep it clean. Yeah, man. Hey, Engraven, I'll take this one first, man. I, I just say that, like, hey, you can't get on fans for how they want a fan. Some Ew. people are, are homers, and they're proud of it. Some people are going <laughs> to poke holes in whatever we do. It's Harbaugh's fault. It's uh, it's uh, Greg Roman's fault. It's Lamar's fault. You, you can't stop people from being people. So um, I'm not going to stop uh, rooting for my hometown team. Like, I'm Baltimore born and bred. So, I mean, I'm Ravens fans all the time, and I just, you know, try to – I would say to to, to, the, to the guy who sent in the question, um, you know, just associate with people who are, who are like-minded when it comes to football if those kind of fans stress you out. Like, talk to people who have a similar mindset. And as far as the season goes, I mean, most of the people I talk to are very, very high on the Ravens this year and for good reason. But you have to remember stuff happens in Graven. Injuries happen. Weathers happen. When you count the uh, – when you catch certain teams happen. So, you know, I'll have my own expectations. I would say step one for me is I want us to win the division, you know. And then if we win the division, see where we land – uh how the team's looking in, in January, you know what I mean? How are they looking in December? Or Then I reset my expectations. So my expectations for this season, beat Cleveland, beat Pittsburgh, win that division, see where we are, and then, hey, I mean, Kansas City's going to be tough, man. Andy Reid is, is – it's not just Patrick Mahomes. It's Andy Reid who seems to have a play for every situation, man. So hmm. we have our work cut out for us. Week two, I think, is a big game for us to – it's one thing to believe you can do it, but it's another thing to have done it 
And I really think this week two game is, is bigger than a normal preseason game. We got to get that monkey off our back, man. Yeah, that uh, that Chiefs game is going to be big, but it's not going to be the biggest because it will still be super early uh, in the season. But it'll be nice for the Ravens to be tested from jump because uh, your first game is against the Raiders and uh, it's Monday Night Football. It's an away game. All the fans will be back. They'll be going crazy. So they'll be in that loud atmosphere and hopefully Ravens can shut everybody up. But I know it's going to be a lot of Ravens fans there too. So they, it's, it's still going to be loud regardless. But um, then after that, you got to play the Chiefs. Uh, but my um expectations for the team this year, and I've said it before uh, a lot of times, I expect them to get, and ho- hopefully I'm wrong, but I expect AFC Championship. Um, I expect AFC Championship game this year. Hopefully they go further than that and go to the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl. Um, but I, I'm just expecting AFC Championship game this year. Um, every year the Ravens have taken it up, up a, a, a notch. Um, now to get AFC Championship, that would have to be taking up a couple notches. But um, I do expect them to get there. Now I honestly feel like they have a team that's good enough to win a Super Bowl. Like they have the players in place. Um, they they have personnel, the coaches. They, they like they can they can do it. They 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 have everything that they need, in my opinion, to win it. And and hopefully they do. Um, now, I, I know you talked about in your question that you you don't want to have unrealistic expectations uh, for the Ravens and, and for them winning the Super Bowl because you don't want to be heartbroken. Trust me. Even if you try to be like, OK, I just think the Ravens are going to make it to the divisional round or I just think they're going to make it to the AFC championship. I just think whatever your expectations are, whatever happens with the Ravens, if they don't make it to the Super Bowl, if they don't win a Super Bowl you're going to be heartbroken regardless because even though you put in your, you might put it in your mind like, Oh, I don't think this team is going to win a Super Bowl. That fan, at least, uh, well, I can just speak for myself. That fan will take over being a fan. It takes over and your love for the team and just the, everything that happens during the season, it takes over and you get caught up and it's like, Oh, because you obviously want them to win every single game. Even if you don't expect them to, you want them to win every single game. You want them to win every single playoff game. You don't ever want your team to lose. Um, but when it gets, especially when it gets to playoff time, when your team can't lose, it's like, oh man, it's just a, it's a different vibe. It's a completely different atmosphere. It's a completely different energy, and, and you just want these guys to do great. Um, so it's regardless what happens. Hopefully, we won't have to go through no heartbreak in the playoffs. But they, they obviously got to get to the playoffs first. But hopefully we don't have to go through any heartbreak in the playoffs. But um, it's just it's, – it's all part of the game, man, as a fan. Yeah, it makes the it makes the Super Bowl even sweeter when you win it because there's only one of 32. I mean, those odds – I'm not a mathematician at Graven. Maybe you can do those numbers <laughs> off the top of your head. But I can't, I, I can't either. And uh, one out of 32, even if you want to say – let's put it this way. There's 10 teams that can win the Super Bowl or eight teams that you think can win the Super Bowl. That's still a 10 or 12% chance or whatever it is. Uh, it's hard, man. It's hard. But uh, you have to get a little lucky too. I think fans forget that, like – You know, you can have the players, but sometimes things, it it could be a call. It could be an injury. You have to get lucky. Luck Mm. is a part of winning. Mm. Oof. Yeah, we're going to see how this thing goes, man. Mm, mm, mm. Next question came from Gabriel. He said, what's up, Engraven? I hope you're having a blessed day, and thank you for keeping us Ravens fans entertained this preseason. Uh, I wanted to talk about a position that nobody else is mentioning, which is the running backs. With Nate McCrary showing off this preseason, do you think it's possible that he knocks Justice Hill out of the roster and possibly, whoa, 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 buddy. He said, and possibly takes Gus Edwards running back two spot. Let me know what you think and stay blessed. Well, the first part, yeah, it's that's what it's looking like, unfortunately, um, especially with Justice Hill having been hurt. So he hasn't got a chance to compete. He hasn't got a chance to do anything since he's been hurt. Um, but him coming for uh, Gus Edwards running back, no, uh-uh, not at all. Uh, and really, I don't even think it's Gus is the running back, too. I think it's more of a 1A, 1B type of thing with him and J.K. Um, but also, we can't forget about Williams. Williams is fighting for a spot, too. Um, so it's going to be – I think he has a slight edge over McCrary. Um, but those two, it seems that those two are battling for that last uh, running back spot. And I think the Ravens will possibly um, – if whichever one of those two doesn't make it, because, again, it's looking like it's going to be one of those two – but whichever one of those two doesn't make it, I think Ravens would try to hope that the other one passes through waivers 
and ends up uh, they can bring him back on the practice squad, which I believe is 16 minute in this year. Uh, but I'm not 1000 percent sure. Uh, how you feeling about uh, McCrary and Williams, too, Jason? You know, I, I just I did a cut up on my channel of all their carries and catches and their pass pro too because pass protection wow. is an important, important. part of mm -hmm. protecting the quarterback. Right. Uh, Tyson Williams' pass protection, by the way, is is a plus plus quality. I mean, he was stonewall on linebackers who had a full steam ahead, taking two steps up and just plowing into them. Love Tyson Williams, but this question is more about McCrary. Uh, I like his quick feet and his elusiveness and his speed. Uh, Gus getting Gus's job. That's yeah, that's a little too much. I mean, we just paid Gus. Gus is a special player. Um, yeah. But I'm hoping big time that we find a way uh, or not find a way that nobody else claims McCrary, that he can stay here, stay on our practice squad and be ready to get uh, to be the next man up because I think there's a lot to like about him. And uh, the thing that kind of makes me a little nervous is that with this third preseason game coming up and the lack of depth, McCrary could go off and just show out and earn himself a roster spot somewhere else. So I'm hoping we can kind of hide him, lay low. I mean, uh, sorry to the McCrary family, but I want you to stay here and be a part of the organization. Next question came from my guy, Gilberto. He said, hey, how you doing, bro? It's been a while. We're Reuben Foster looking to make a comeback. What do you think of the idea of having Patrick Queen, Malik Harrison, and Reuben Foster in the same lineup? Patrick Queen, as good as he is, is only going to get better, which is scary. Uh, Malik Harrison is a big physical thumper that is getting better in coverage every day that he's out there. Uh, and then think about having Foster, a big, very physical, hard-hitting, good in coverage linebacker. Wide receivers won't dare come through the middle. Uh, I know he's had some off-the-field issues, but I believe in redeeming yourself, plus his talent is too great not to give him a chance. Thank you, and keep up all the good work. As always, keep it clean. And like Rashad Perryman's hands, when it comes to catching the ball, I'm out. I should block you for that alone. Um, but with, uh, with what you mentioned, I, and, and I agree, I do believe in redeeming yourself too. Um, but I don't, I don't think the Ravens will take the chance on, uh, on Ruben Foster. Um, I think they will look to other avenues, whether it's other players, whether it's in house. And that's what it seemed like they are going to try in house. And then even possibly like we're recording this video on August 26. Um, the, the rosters have to go from 80 to 53 on September 1st, I believe. Um, so, well, yeah, September 1st. No. Yeah, yeah, September 1st. Um, and, well, August 31st, September 1st, whatever. But uh, I think that if they still want to look for outside help, then they're going to wait till they have all of their options open uh, when everybody cuts those rosters down. But I, I don't think they're going to go after Ruben Foster. What about you, Jason? Yeah, I agree with you. I think that they're going to wait to see who comes free because the value of inside linebackers is it's pretty much at an all-time low in the NFL with a lot of defensive backs being asked to be on the field, a passing league. I mean, you know, all the all the uh, slogans and, uh, you know, generalizations that are pretty much true. It's, it's a smaller, faster game. Now, I did love Reuben Foster coming out of college. Uh, it's unfortunate to see what's happened with him. Uh, the Ravens are willing to give players second chances or players who just don't fit in the organization. Like Marcus Peters never had any off the field problems, but he bounced around but despite leading the league in interception since he came into it. So if a person cares about football and he wants things done right, uh, the Ravens are willing to – uh, give that person a chance if they fit in their organization. Uh, so, you know, prayers out to Ruben Foster. I hope that he does get to play. But as far as uh, pri making it a priority to bring him in, a lot of things would have to go uh, our way or his way for him to be here. Next question came from my guy, BB. He said, hey, man, thanks for all the positivity. Uh, lots of negativity these days, especially when talking about, one, Lamar Jackson. Was wondering, do you think if Lamar played for another team, would he still get the negative reinforcement? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, look, I'm just trying to figure out why he is not respected in the league that he dominates. Hashtag team, keep it clean. Hashtag positive. Oof. That is a really, really good question. If Lamar was on another team, do you think he would get the same negative reinforcement? Um, Him being on another team, I think it, it was a high chance that he could, um, especially the way that he is. Uh, but I think another thing that would um, feed into it would be how the team used him. You know, the Ravens, they uh, have Lamar Jackson. This offense is just 
it's unorthodox. It's, it's just different. It's different. Uh, the same way Lamar Jackson is different, this Ravens offense is just different. Um, and it is not your typical NFL offense. And again, like my guy Jason was just saying, it is a passing league. Uh, and the Ravens, while they are very efficient with passing, um, with it being a passing league, a lot of people and teams, analysts, experts, all that, they look at passing yards. Um, and with Ravens, they still going old school. They still running that ball like crazy. And the thing about it, they, they don't care. They don't care. Even though the league is doing this, the Ravens are doing that. Uh, but if he was on another team, I think a lot of it would just depend on the way that he was used on that other team. It would depend on the way that the offense was run on that other team. But I still like, I still think it's a high chance that it, it will still be a lot of the, uh, the same stuff. But it, it would just depend on so much. Yeah, that is a great question, and I, I agree with you. I think that uh, Lamar is just a naturally polarizing player. So there, he would have his haters for reasons that I don't even want to get into on the show. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, Lamar is a polarizing player. But coming to an organization like the Ravens, who has a history of success, and then they – it did the best thing for Lamar as a rookie, and that's bringing in a coordinator like Greg Roman, having putting together and engraving a historic running game. Like our fans get frustrated with it, but we are breaking records from teams in the 1950s when Jim Brown were breaking Walter Payton's records. I mean, this is a crazy, crazy scenario. But to go the other way, if Lamar say was drafted by the Lions and they bring in a passing uh, coordinator, and they spread them out with Marvin Jones and Kenny Galladay and all the other guys that they had, Golden Tate, whoever else, and Lamar throws for 4,000 yards and, and leads the Lions to the playoffs, uh, that criticism would have been way quieted. So hmm. Lamar is a victim of the Ravens' success and the great Roman scheme, which is historically a running team. The last question on this episode of NFL question from subscribers came from my guy, uh, Big Cam. He said, hey, Raven, very quick question. Do you think that Deshaun Elliott has the medal to be an inside linebacker? And just a little side note, I had to look up the definition of medal because I almost thought that my guy was using the wrong word, but he was using the right word. And I learned a new word today. And medal is a person's ability to cope well with difficulties or to face a demanding situation in a spirited and resilient way. Well, uh, and appreciate you putting me onto the word medal. To answer your question, look at Deshaun Elliott versus Derrick Henry, and I'm done. Jason, you can take it away. Heavy metal, heavy metal when it comes to Deshaun Elliott. It's uh, <laughs> not just a uh, an 80s thing, 80s rock thing. Deshaun Elliott has heavy metal. Um, yeah, and uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, you, sometimes you got to take the labels off. Uh, Deshaun Elliott can play in that box. He can roam around. I would not make him a full-time inside linebacker because he offers you something on the back end of the defense, and that's special. That's something that you couldn't ask a guy like Malik to do. Like Malik can't play free safety, you know what I mean? But Malik can play linebacker. Deshaun Elliott can play both. I think Deshaun would actually be great in Chuck Clark's role, not trying to rush yes. Chuck Clark out the door. Right, right. But imagine, imagine Deshaun just having the freedom in that defense to be able to roll, uh, roam around and and just and hunt. You know, just hunt. But yeah, uh, would you say spirit, resilience, courage, all those things? I think uh, Adam uh, adequately uh, described Deshaun Elliott. Shout out to Graven.